Welcome to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith from the studios of our flagship stations, 89.3 Lakes FM and Civic Center TV. In addition, today, as always, we're joined by Birmingham Area Municipal Access, a service of the Birmingham Area Cable Board. All of our TV stations are on Comcast Channel 15 and in the Community, Rate, community Television and Public Access guide on AT&T channel 99. We're also on the web civiccentertv.com. Click on our watch live link at the top of our homepage or view us in that small player in the top right of our homepage on your web browser on your computer or laptop. We're also on social media facebook.com slash civiccentertv15 and facebook.com slash lakesfm and today for the first time we are joined on your smart TV, on your tablet, on your phone, and a number of different, uh, and a number of different mobile media, on my my TV, on my Michigan television, you can find that on a number of different. Uh, different app stores, including the Apple App Store and Android as well, and on your smart TV, your Roku, your Apple TV Plus, and more. It's, it's Michigan television from all over the state. We'll have a little bit more on, on what exactly that is later on in the show. We'll have one of the executive producers of My Michigan TV, or My My, joining us here in the studio to talk a little bit about that after we speak with state with uh, U.S. Senator Gary Peters. Now, as always, today uh, I normally would be joined by Ronnie all Ronnie today has the day, the day off. Uh, she is having um, some, some um, she's not feeling very well today. She's having some back problems this morning, called in, said she needs the day off, and we, of course, want to give her the day off. She has uh, doing a great job here, and this is her last full week with the, sh the show. She will be doing some fill-in with us next week as we transition into the next era of the Oakland County Megacast, and always thank Ronnie for her great work here on the show over the past year and some change. As always, there's a lot going on in the news throughout the state of Michigan and the U.S. regarding coronavirus and other top headlines for all of that. You can go to our website at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, where each day we, we post the latest headlines as well as resources from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the state of Michigan, Oakland County, and many of our local municipalities here in the Oakland County area, including West Bloomfield Township, uh, Rochester, Troy, Pontiac, and more. If you click on those links, it'll take you directly to their COVID-19 page. For example, here, if you're watching us on TV, on Facebook, or on the My My app, you're now seeing, I clicked on the Pontiac link on civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, and it took me directly to the city of Pontiac's COVID-19 information center. So instead of having to dig around for all of this stuff on the internet and try to find it directly for your, this information directly for your community, if you need direct COVID-19 information in the city of Pontiac, if that's where you live or work, you can just go right to our website, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, and click on the link for Pontiac. And of course, we all always post the latest articles today that are making headlines and this and this first an article from MLive.com these 10 Michigan counties should return to mask orders per CDC guidelines vaccinated individuals should mask up indoors in areas where coronavirus transmission is quote unquote substantial or high according to the latest federal health get guidance on Tuesday July 27th the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention provided updated recommendations regarding mask use as case and test positivity are beginning to climb across the country. The nation's new dominant strain of coronavirus, the Delta variant, is believed to be more infectious than previous strains and it could spread easier from vaccinated to unvaccinated individuals. The guidance comes with a four-level rating system to evaluate community transmission of the virus based on new weekly cases per 100,000 residents and weekly test positivity. If the indicators suggest different transmission levels, the county is placed in the higher level. For the state of Michigan, 10 of the state's 83 counties fall in either the high or substantial transmission categories, indicating a need for mask usage indoors regardless of vaccination status in order to slow the spread of the virus and protect those who cannot or have not received a vaccine. Those counties that are, in, that are among the 10 are Alpena, Branch, Cass County, Dickinson, uh, Gugabic, 
Hillsdale, Iron, Kalkaska, Mason, and Van Buren counties. Branch and Dickinson counties report high transmission levels meeting more than 100 cases per 100,000 people per week or a positivity rate of 10% or higher as we have heard throughout the COVID-19 pandemic that three, three and a half percent mark of positive cases among their tests is what is considered to be a low chance of community spread. In this case, that is, this is more than double that in, uh, in Branch and Dickinson County. So that is, of course, a of high concern to health officials, both in those counties at the state level and at the federal level. As we've seen the CDC this week come out and make new suggestions and new guidelines for mask wearing indoors, regardless of your vaccination status, as we've seen in recent weeks, the vast majority, almost uh, uh, just under 100%, just about 99% of new COVID-19 cases over the last several weeks have been among those that have been un that are unvaccinated. And so it's even more of an incentive, uh, even more of a push is being made at the federal level and certainly at the state level and local level as well in order to get people vaccinated against COVID-19, or at least if they're hesitant to get them seeking new information or, or accurate information from medical officials in their community or from their primary care doctors who they know and who they trust uh, about these vaccines so that they can make the best decision for themselves and for their families. And of course, it's a big concern also for schools as we're heading toward the beginning of the new school year. And later on in the show, we'll speak with one local superintendent about how they're taking that into effect and into account as they plan for this upcoming school year as schools are really looking to, to be excited as we're parents, as we're teachers, as we're uh, the entire community to have kids back in the classroom. And of course, the Delta variant spread and the current COVID-19 situation, not just here in the state of Michigan, but across the United States is of growing concern as the Delta variant continues to spread throughout the state. Um, also affecting, affected by the Delta variant of COVID-19 is a return to workplaces as Google has announced. It is delaying the workers return to the office and is mandating vaccines. Google is postponing a return to the office for most workers until mid-October and rolling out a policy that will eventually require everyone to be vaccinated once its sprawling campuses are fully reopened in an attempt to fight the spread of Delta variant. In a Wednesday email sent to Google, sent to Google's more than 130,000 employees, CEO Sandra Pichai said the company is now aiming to have most of its workers back in its offices beginning October 18th, instead of the previous target of September 1st. The decision also affects tens of thousands of contractors who Google intends to continue to pay while access to its campuses remains limited. Uh, Pichai also disclosed that once offices are fully reopened, everyone working there will be will have to be vaccinated. The requirement will first be imposed at Google's Mountain View, California headquarters and other U.S. offices before being extended to the more than 40 other countries where the company uh, operates. The vaccine mandate will be adjusted to adhere to the laws and regulators of each location. P Pichai, uh, uh, Pikahi wrote, and exceptions will be made for medical and other protected reasons. And so uh, this is another one of those major employers not, uh, throughout the U.S. that is requiring COVID-19 vaccinations here locally. Of course, a little bit of controversy recently, and we'll touch on this more in, in the next article as Henry Ford Health System uh, mandated that all of its employees and its contractors and those com and those that are vendors for all of its locations would be need to be vaccinated by September 10th. And we're starting to see more companies, big and small, um, whether they be multi-billion dollar corporations or small mom and, mom and pop operations and restaurants and bars in the local area that are starting to require their employees to be vaccinated. And some are taking uh, even more extreme efforts to require patrons that are coming in to show uh, physical tangi tangible proof whether it be a picture or the vaccination card itself in order to, to enter and to patronize their business. I think this is going to be something that becomes more common over time. Uh, and the, the problem here that I think will come up for a lot of these companies, especially those smaller companies in the local area, is whether or not they'll be able to re replace those employees that maybe will not get vaccinated. And I'd be interested to see what, re what um, guidelines they have in place for those employees that maybe cannot 
get vaccinated. That's also certainly a question, whether it be for medical reasons, whether they won't get vaccinated for religious purposes. We're hearing a lot about these mandates, but as we hear about these mandates, we don't necessarily hear about the exceptions to the rules that give people options should they have legitimate objections for their own health or for the religious purposes that would exclude them from being uh, able to get vaccinated against COVID-19 and be able to return to the workplace. Also making headlines today, Beaumont and Spectrum Health Systems also will require COVID-19 for their workers. Beaumont Health and Spectrum on Wednesday became the latest hospital systems in Michigan to require the COVID-19 vaccine for staff and others as cases of the new strain of the virus rise in the state of Michigan. We have a duty to protect our, our patients and our staff, said Beaumont Health CEO, John Fox in the statement. The Delta variant is the most contagious form of COVID-19. It spreads, mu spreads much faster than the original version of the virus. We want all Beaumont team members to stay healthy. The vaccine is the only safe and effective way to truly prevent this, uh, the spread of COVID-19. He said it's a truly the only safe and effective way to truly protect against COVID-19 in this article from Mark Hicks of the Detroit News. Beaumont's mandate for employees and providers practicing medicine or working at facilities across its eight hospital system eight hospital system would go into effect after the US Food and Drug Administration fully approves one or more of the current vaccines which is expected early this fall representative said Beaumont said its staffers must be fully vaccinated within six weeks of the FDA approval of any viable COVID-19 vaccine. Those who do not meet exemptions and refuse vaccination will initially be suspended, according to its announcement on Wednesday. Uh, of course, that's that's a, a, a nice step in there to put them on suspension initially instead of fully terminating them so that there can more, more than likely that there, there can be some negotiation there, some deliberation there to figure out why this employee or these employees have not gotten vaccinated against COVID-19. See if they can get them some more resources and maybe bring them further along to a point where they are comfortable getting the vaccination or at least give them a chance to explain themselves. Maybe they are able to make an, another exception to the rule or they'll be able to qualify under one of these health systems uh, different exemptions for COVID-19 vaccination requirements instead of just outright saying you are going to lose your job. It could be a situation where you may lose your job. Let's talk this through, see if we can come to a solution and then make a decision, uh, which I think would be much more well received by these patients, although this situation is a uh, it's not exactly their ideal situation. Grand Rapid, the Grand Rapids based Spectrum Health, which has 14 hospitals, 31,000 workers, and some 2,573 hospital beds, said it would require COVID-19 vaccination for team members, medical staff, medical students, volunteers, and contractors within eight weeks of the FDA approving any of the viable vaccines and consider exemptions as required by law. That article from the Detroit News written by Mark Hicks. And you can find that article and all and all updated news each and every day on our website at civiccentertv.com. Just click on our coronavirus link and you'll find links to these articles and more from not just today and, and throughout this week, but all the way back to the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. It really is a, a nice little history lesson there for all of us as we take a look back and as we uh, get closer and closer slowly but surely to maybe being out of this pandemic. We're certainly not there yet. There's still a lot of concerns because of the Delta variant rising cases in many places throughout the U.S. and of course the slowed down vaccination process but we can really see where we've come from and where we're going we're all from one spot, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. And as more regulations come into place, as more guidelines are tossed out there by the Centers for Disease Control, by the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, by the Oakland County Health Division, you'll be able to find those directly from links at our website, such as the Centers for Disease Control resources. You click on that link at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, and here it goes. It take you, takes you directly to the CDC's COVID-19 
page gives you more information about guidance for people getting for, for guidance for people who are fully vaccinated. Gives you COVID vac COVID transmission by county information on the many different COVID-19 variants and more that you need to know about COVID-19. So you can get your questions, at least initial questions answered from this resource if you're able to have access to the web or at the very least you can get some basic information so yet you are better informed about what you can do to keep yourself safe but also your community safe as we continue to navigate this COVID-19 pandemic. Because like we've been doing throughout this entire process, like we've been doing since March of 2020, we're learning as we go. This is a novel coronavirus. This is a once in a generation pandemic, hopefully, that we're experiencing. Very few of us, if any of us, have experienced something like this before and hopefully never do again. But we're continuing to learn and we want to make sure that you have all the resources you need to make the best decisions for yourself for your family and for those around you each and every day. And you can find a lot of those re very helpful resources on our website, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. Now, we have a really good show for you today as, as we have a number of great guests, really interesting and widespread information today on the Oakland County Megacast. Coming up in a 10 o'clock hour, we'll start off. Yesterday, of course, we talked to Travel Michigan's Dave Lorenz, and today we'll talk to a local travel group about how they're helping their customers navigate of course, what's going on with COVID-19 and with everything that's affecting our travel industry, but still being able to have those great summer vacations and make those memories with their friends and with their family right here in the Great Lakes State throughout the summer. And at, at the uh, bottom of the hour, we'll speak with a speech pathologist from Henry Ford Health System as well. And then in the 11 o'clock hour, with all this inclement weather we've had recently, especially the onslaught of rain, it's really affected our water systems. It's of course caused major flooding flooding throughout Oakland County and our surrounding counties as well. We'll speak to the Oakland County Water Resources Commissioner Jim Nash at 11 o'clock and then in the second hour of the show we'll also be speaking with U.S. Senator Gary Peters, Ken Gutman, the Superintendent of Schools in the Wald Lake Consolidated School District and we'll give you more information about a, a great new app on your smart TV, on your cell phone, on your tablet and more that gives you access to original programming from around the state of Michigan. That all coming up on today's edition of the Oakland County Megacast. We have a great show for you today and we are going to bring you more after this break. You're listening to, our, to the, the family of TV, radio and other media outlets here on the Oakland County Megacast. We will kick off the show with, with the Cadillac Travel Group after this break. You're listening and watching the Oakland County Megacast. The Trevor Project is sharing how you can support LGBTQ youth who may be at risk. It's simple. Just show them that you care. C-A-R-E, connect. If you noticed any warning signs of suicide from someone you know, reach out to them. Ask, ask directly, are you thinking about killing yourself? It might be challenging, but talking about suicide is proven to reduce risk. Respond, if they open up to you about their suicidal ideation, honor that trust by responding with compassion and empathy. Empower. Talking openly is a great first step, but now you can empower them with the information and the support they need to improve their situation. Learn more about how you can show them you care and help prevent LGBTQ youth suicide. Visit trvr.org slash care. To Sofia and Gabriel, even though these old knees can't follow on your adventure to the forest today, these flowers represent my love. These stitches and threads join us together. And wherever you see a flower, a bird, a beautiful tree, know that my love is with you. Make the forest part of your story at a park near you. Find one at discovertheforest.org. People are getting out to walk and bike in higher numbers. More vulnerable road users and higher speed traffic can be a dangerous combination. Crash severity has increased. So if you're driving, be sure to slow down and look for people. There's no need to speed. If you're biking, ride with traffic. If you're walking, avoid stepping into the road if possible. If you have to walk in the street, walk facing traffic. Learn more at walkbikedrivesafe.org. you can look for in your friends is a change in behavior. These can be big changes, they can be small changes in mood, 
physical appearance. They may be sleeping less or sleeping more and drinking more or their eating patterns may be different. One big change that can be pretty obvious is change in motivation. Do they no longer want to play basketball? Do they no longer want to play video games? Now that we're spending more time online and in virtual settings, it's really important to pay attention to the language that your friend is using and the words they're using to communicate. So when we text our friends, are they taking longer amounts of time to respond? Are they not responding at all? You don't have to be an expert to try to recognize these signs. The second that you feel it in your gut and that you're concerned, that's the second to have the conversation and open the door to what might be going on. Whatever, whatever, whatever you think. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keeft in our flagship studios here in West Bloomfield at Green Media Center. You're watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast on Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access, 88.1 WBFH The Biff, 89.3 Lakes FM, and online on Facebook via Facebook Live, as well as on the My Michigan TV app or My My. Today, for the first time, we welcome them to our family of TV, radio, and other media outlets, as well as we have been traveling throughout the state of Michigan virtually over the course of the pandemic, talking to a number of, of guests about COVID-19 and other important topics. And as we're in the thick of the summer season, people are still looking to have a little bit of an adventure during this crisis of ours uh, with COVID-19. And some per and one person that's helping them do that is our first guest today, David Fishman. He is the president of the Cadillac Travel Group based out of Royal Oak. And he joins us now on the Oakland County Megacast. David, thank you for being with us today. Well, thank you for having me, Tyler. It's a pleasure. Appreciate having you on. You've been serving the community uh, here and serving the state here for about 38 years with the Cadillac, <laughs> Cadillac Travel Group. Can you tell us a little bit about the services that you provide to people that are looking to find those great experiences here in the state of Michigan? Yeah, what's great is that we're a full service travel provider. We can take care of any and all of your travel needs, whether it just be airline tickets, hotels, car rentals, cruises, um, tours, you name it, we can take care of it. We can even get you tested to make sure that you can go to where you want to go and make sure that you're safe and uh, we have all the information of what's open and what's not. So it's it's a great resource. We're a tremendous resource and help and for creating peace of mind right now with their travel needs. And, and with what's going on right now, especially with the increased spread of the Delta variant of COVID-19, as people are looking to make those those plans, are you noticing that people are maybe a little bit more hesitant now than they were in the past few weeks or the past month or so to seek out those adventures here in the state of Michigan and, and try to put together their travel plans? Are they more hesitant now or are people still just as excited now as they were before to travel throughout our state? Well, the reality is, is that People have been, you know, the number one thing people want to do during COVID is travel because they couldn't, they couldn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So the demand is is just tremendous. They, they're actually calling it revenge travel. They're having revenge for 2020. That being said, every time that something new comes up in the COVID arena, in, in this case, the Delta variant, uh, there does create additional hesitance of getting out and going places. Um, in, in a general sense, that's where it's really important that if you're going to go someplace that you really do your homework, that you know what the rules are. Why the Delta variance is happening, meanwhile, the UK is opening up tomorrow, and in two weeks, Canada is opening up. So as these things are happening in certain areas, other areas are becoming safer. So it's really in just finding your comfort zone in where you're going to go and what's going to happen. And, and even in Michigan, even though it's gone up a little bit more, we're still doing a lot better than a, a number of the southern states, for example. So staying in Michigan creates a, a better comfort than going south right now, perhaps. So. We're joined by David Fishman. He's the president of the Cadillac Travel Group based out of Royal Oak. And, and David, I'm going to take a step back here just for a brief moment and play a little bit of devil's ad advocate as I'm going into this question. Over the past several years and in our modern days, with all the access we have to technology and to information, to be able to go and research different places that different places that we can go and different events we can go to, different activities we can do at one place or another, to bargain and look around and shop around for plane tickets or train tickets or or so on and so forth. In today's age, 
How can a travel agent, such as, uh, such as one at the Cadillac Travel Group, be helpful to people as they're planning these vacations, especially right now with all of the variables that are at play due to COVID-19? Well, the, the irony is, is we're even more important than we've ever been because of those uh, the, the constant changes. You know, the whole this whole time has taught us that wait five minutes, it'll change. It's, I always say, like, the airline fares are like the weather in Michigan. Wait five minutes, they'll change. But in this case, it's about what you can and cannot do. So it's even more important to, A, have someone that has the information and is constantly reviewing it to make sure it's safe for you to go. Have someone that's going to be there for you to make sure that you are protected in regards to booking a trip with your insurances and what the rules of cancellation are or changes um, and having an advocate while you're traveling. So, you know, if there's something going on or you don't know what's going on, there's someone to reach out to during this period of time right now, in particular, because of what went on with many of the major travel vendors like Delta airlines, for example, in, in, in our area or some of the other major players, you can't get through to them there's a two to three or four hour wait and the changes are constantly happening. So to have that advocate, to have someone that has, you know, we have over 400 years of travel destination knowledge in your office is invaluable to give you that peace of mind now more than ever before. We're joined by David Fishman, the president of Cadillac Travel Group here on the Oakland County Megacast. I was talking about traveling throughout the state of Michigan and all the variables that are at play right now and how uh, services such as what he provides and his team provides at Cadillac Travel Group are helping Michigan travel travelers and people that are coming into the state as well as they're planning their trips to the Great Lakes State. And you talk about protections and, and travel insurances. And earlier on uh, in the pandemic, uh, my co-host Ronnie Dahl has, has told me a story many times about her uh, trying to go to Italy last year just before the pandemic. And of course, that trip got canceled and she was going through the whole rigmarole of trying to get uh, her trip refunded, uh, her plane ticket refunded, and that was in itself a whole different hassle than what was to be expected. So in today's traveling scenario, how import more important now than ever is travel insurance? And when people are purchasing that travel insurance, what protections can they expect to have provided to them, or are there varying lengths of where that can go? Well, that's, and, and then you hit the nail on the head, Tyler. It's so important more than ever to know what you're getting in regards to when you book something, what the cancellations are, and then when you get the insurances, what the policy actually covers. Understanding that is, is hugely important in working with the right travel insurance providers to make sure you are gonna be protected. Like some didn't cover COVID and some are covering COVID and some cover COVID if you get it when you travel, but they don't cover COVID if you get it before you travel. So there's so many uh, pardon the expression, but variants in your travel insurance. So you want to make sure that you're working with a professional that can guide you and make sure you have the proper coverages before you go. And there's another piece. It's like there's insurances that, that you can cancel for any reason. So even if you don't have a medical reason or don't have COVID, you can cancel. A lot of people don't know about that. And many of the travel insurances do not provide that type of coverage. So you have to know about what you can get and what you can't get. And then, uh, you know, of course, and then there's, you know, the pricing's all over the board. And then there's, it, the, and also you have to make sure you know who you're working with. If you're working with a, a, a travel insurance company that is legitimate, you know, I always say, I am a French model because it says so online. So you can tell anyone you want information online. It doesn't mean that there's, that you're dealing with a, a legitimate situation. And that's why it's more important to have a guide and someone helping you right now, in particular with travel insurance as well. David Fishman joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. He is the president of Cadillac Travel Group, which is based out of Royal Oak, with us today on the program throughout the Oakland County area and throughout the state of Michigan on the My Michigan TV or My My app. And as you're navigating the insurance situation, how are travel agents helpful to their to their clients in navigating that situation where the, the client does need to exercise their travel insurance? Because as you said earlier on, there are 
there are those delays. You are jumping through hoops. You are trying to navigate the situation. Going at it alone can be a hassle, but it, it's got to be a hassle overall. What more can a legitimate travel agent do to really help move that situation along and, if need be, get the customer ref refunded or get them in a different situation where they can still get what they're seeking, maybe just in a different form? Well, it's in, in, and that's about relationships. So 38 years of relationships with the travel vendors has created the ability to get a hold of people when people can't, to get a hold of the right people to get answers or get problems solved. And for example, last week, um, I went to lunch on Friday with my travel insurance rep who came in town and we were able to go out and talk about what's going on and what's, what, what's new moving forward because they have some new products that they have that will be beneficial to people. And so they have that one phone call to say, hey, I'm having a problem getting this you know, claim taken care of. Can you look into this? Can you move forward? And I've also have met the president of the company and the CEO, like I have a relationship with the CEO in a, in, of, of um, Royal Caribbean, which I just went on a cruise. So I can inform people about what cruising is gonna be like in the protocol. So I was invited to have that opportunity to share that information. So, so that's about relationships will help us take care of those situations a lot quicker, a lot easier than an individual can do it. You mentioned earlier too, David, that uh, you wanna make sure that you're working with a travel agent that is a legitimate travel agent. As customers are looking to plan their trips with a travel agent. What do what should they be looking for and how do they know that the agent that they're working for is a legitimate travel agent, as you said? Well, I, I think one of the, my, you know, my favorite things is if you can't reach out and touch them, then don't do business with them. It's my, one of my personal mm -hmm. things. It's if you can't walk in someone's door, and nowadays there, it is more virtual, but you know, look at their history and don't, and, and it's not always looking at reviews necessarily because anyone can write a review about anything i could have 20 people write a review it doesn't mean that they even done business with me i think it's it's more about um either finding people that have done business with them or actually walking in their door or being able to know that it's local that it's a you know a state of michigan that you're not dealing with someone that's in some other country or doesn't even exist or you know, we always hear the horror stories of the spring breakers that go, or group that goes away and they get there and they don't have anything. And it's a PO box, you know, have an address that, you know, look for an address. I think that's important as well. So little things um, that make a difference is making sure that you can find, I really think the most important is actually knowing either a word of mouth from someone that you trust and or knowing that you can walk in their door just actually physically meet them face to face. We're joined by David Fishman on the Oakland County Megacast. He is the president of the Cadillac Travel Group based out of Royal Oak, talking to us about all the little things we need to know as we're planning our trips this summer, both here in the state of Michigan, throughout the U.S., and for those of us that are traveling internationally as well. And so let's let's get into more of the nitty-gritty with different kinds of travel. Let's start with, it, with air travel. Right now, with what's going on throughout the U.S., you want to be prepared when you're going into any sort of a travel situation, especially if you're flying or if you're going, uh, whether it be domestically or internationally. Right now, if travelers are going to be traveling out of the state of Michigan, whether it be somewhere in the U.S. or internationally, what should they be doing differently than before to prepare themselves for those trips? Well, first of all, you, you must find out what the rules are in regards to where you're going to. So you might need to have a test to go there even like when you were going to Hawaii, even in the States, you needed to have a test and you need to know which test and where you can get the test. So for example, once again, Hawaii, you had to go to a CVS or Walgreens that has specifically had a relationship with Hawaii to do the test. If you went to just any testing center, you wouldn't be able to get in. So that's really important to know what you need to do to go to that place and to fly there then you have to know what the rules are coming back home. And if you leave the country, according to CDC, you must have a test that you must get within 72 hours, a negative test to come back into the country. So then you wanna make sure that when you're flying there, that you know where you can get the test for where you're going to. Now, the good news, many of the hotels and many places are making it very uh, 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 available to people 
to get the test so they can make sure they can come back home. So they're making that easy. Then the last thing you need to know is what are gonna be the rules of actually flying on that airline. And right now, almost all the airlines have to have a mask. It's, it's, if you are not willing to wear a mask, you will not be able to fly on that airline. And understanding what the, the airlines are doing to make you feel better in regards to, uh, they're fogging the planes, they're wiping down the planes, and the air on the planes is recirculated from the outside, not within the plane actually probably one of the safest places to be in a gathering of a lot of people is on an airplane than any place else you could be on an indoor gathering. So when you understand all those pieces, that makes it really comfortable for you to get on an airplane. We're joined by David Fishman, the president of Cadillac Travel Group based out of Royal Oak on the Oakland County Megacast today. And uh, David, Delta Airlines is now adding their middle seat back to their flights. How is that going to impact how people are going, are going to need to be planning their travel, particularly with Delta Airlines, and is there anything additionally that people need to be take any steps that people need to be taking additionally in order to prepare for their flights with Delta, which is one of our more common airlines uh, domestically? Oh yeah, they have more than 80% of the lift out of Metropolitan Detroit Air, mm -hmm. um, out of Michigan. That being said, um, prior to, for the last six months at least, if not longer, the other major carriers, United and American, for example, we're already filling up that middle seat. The, the fact that that seat wasn't filled up with Delta was really trying to create a, a more of a comfort zone for people, but in a general sense, it didn't make a big difference in regards to the proper protocols to make sure that you are safe on that airplane. And they are following those protocols to make sure that you are gonna be safe with flying with them. So even if there's someone sitting next to you, um, you are not gonna have a problem if you wear your mask and make sure that you uh, do the right things while you're flying on an airplane. And they're doing a lot of the right things for you. What about ticket prices for, for airlines? Obviously, with uh, just the basics of supply and demand, as less people are flying throughout the pandemic, then there are more seats available, and Delta still needs to ultimately make their, uh, make their best efforts for their bottom line, you would expect those prices to go up. As things are starting to reopen, as more people are going out to travel, and as they're having more seats be available on these planes, can consumers expect for the, for the prices of their flights to drop, or should they expect them to maybe rise as, their, as the demand for traveling by air travel goes up? Well, it, it'll, it'll definitely, you know, air travel has always been based on, the cost of it's always been based on demand mm -hmm. and availability. So in this case, a lot of flights were canceled during COVID and they've been adding them up very slowly to make sure they're not having planes flying empty. So that being said, the pricing has continued to go, go, go up actually pretty dramatically to some destinations as we get as we move forward. I mean, I literally just flew to Florida on Friday and the round trip ticket that I bought that I was trying to buy a week ahead of time was $1,200 round trip to Miami. That's normally a $400, $500 ticket max, usually. Maybe up to 800, but 1200? So if depending on how many seats are sold and how many seats are added back into inventory will cause the rates to be go up or down. In this case, right now they're going up and they've been going up dramatically, especially if you haven't planned for Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, spring break, midwinter break. If you're not planning that already, expect to have a little sticker shock and when you purchase your airline tickets. So as, as people are preparing for the holiday season and for, and for spring break next year, when should they be getting into that mode of planning for that trip and starting to purchase their airline tickets, look for, ho for hotels and, and other amenities throughout their trip? Because that is a busy season and presumably by then, hopefully we're even further along getting ourselves out of this pandemic. Well, you need to plan yesterday in this case. <laughs> you need to plan as far ahead as possible. Airline tickets, the, the, the scheduling comes out 330 days ahead of time in general in most markets so as soon as you can plan you like to try and plan in particular the air hotels as well if you grab your hotel space at a time they're all kind of inventory controlled and with the airlines it's actually computer inventory controlled so when none say sell a certain block of seats the seats are going to go up in price so the sooner you can grab it, the, the better that's why another reason to take insurance on some things like airline tickets that are non-refundable um, hotels will give you greater flexibility, sometimes with tours and cruises also. 
So the sooner you can plan, the better, and the greater flexibility you have, greater chance you have of saving money on your travel. David Fishman with us on the Oakland County Megacast. He's the president of Cadillac Travel Group based out of Royal Oak, Michigan. And uh, people aren't just traveling um, by air. They're also, they're also going domestically in the state of Michigan. They're traveling from place to place. Many of our many great locations here throughout the state of Michigan to travel throughout the summer. Or they are traveling dom domestically to another state and maybe not bringing their personal vehicle with them. But right now, it can be really tough to get a rental car, how can people, how should people be preparing if they're going to an area without their own personal vehicle to make sure that they will have one available for them and be able to travel efficiently in their location? Well, that's, I mean, that's a great point. What happened during COVID is many of the car rental companies dumped off inventory um, because of a non-rented car, a car sitting there doesn't make money. So they dumped it off. And of course, with chip shortages and not knowing how much, how quickly things would ramp up, they weren't adding to that inventory very quickly. They weren't buying new fleets. So because of that, there was an actual shortage and continues to be a shortage in a number of markets. That being said, once again, plan ahead, be flexible, and perhaps, I mean, the ultimate creativity, I, I, had, I actually had a client down in Orlando, couldn't get a rent a car, and was got down there and saw that they, they Ubered to the hotel, and as they were driving by, they saw, U-Haul, 19.95 a day. They went to the U-Haul place oh. and they drove a U-Haul for a week down in Orlando. Very creative. Um, sometimes you have to do that, or you have to Uber or uh, find other modes of transportation, or you're going to be paying also a premium if there is available car rentals in that area. David Fishman with us. He is the president of Cadillac Travel Group, located out of Royal Oak, Michigan. Joining us today on the Megacast, David, just another minute or so with you before we have to say goodbye today. Anything else that's important for our audience to know as they're planning their travels and how can they get in contact with you and with Cadillac Travel Group? Well, like, uh, you know, as I, I, I know I'm harped on it, make sure that you know who you're dealing with. Make sure that you uh, protect yourself and know what, what the rules are gonna be where you're going, make sure you have good insurance and know what the rules are with the insurance. Be flexible, that will save you money. Plan ahead, that will save you money. And at the end of the day, work with a travel professional because there's the most sites on the internet are travel sites and you don't know exactly who you're dealing with all the time. So make sure you're working with someone that you know, that we refer to, that can take care of you and protect you. You can reach Cadillac Travel at 248-358-5330 or 800-369-TRIP. You can go to www.cadillactravel.com or david at cadillactravel.com and you can reach out and we'll take care of you. David, great advice. Thank you very much for joining us on today's edition of the Megacast. Thank you, Tyler. Have a great day. You as well. Appreciate it. David Fishman, the president of Cadillac Travel Group, located out of Royal Oak, Michigan. Appreciate having him on the program today. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll speak to one local doctor who is combining speech therapy and music to help her patients in the local area. That coming up next, you're listening to the Oakland County Megacast on our family of TV, radio, and other media outlets. The Megacast returns after this. Here's one more reason to get the COVID-19 vaccine. It's your shot to win. Anyone 18 years or older in Michigan vaccinated between December 1st, 2020 and July 30th, 2021 is now eligible to win millions in cash prizes, including million dollar jackpots and $50,000 daily prizes. And vaccinated students could win thousands in college scholarships. For eligibility details and to enter, go to mishottowin.com. Today, it is easier than ever to join Michigan's organ donor registry and help build a bridge of hope for organ, tissue, and eye donation. Just one person can potentially save or help improve the lives of up to 75 people. By joining, your legacy could be the gift of life. Sign up today at michigan.gov SOS or at any of the more than 145 Secretary of State self-service stations located across Michigan. Be part of Michigan's Bridge of Hope by adding your name to the organ donor registry. How does marijuana affect the teen brain? Our brains are still developing into our 20s. With regular use, marijuana can affect teen brain development. It can affect our brain's circuitry and blood flow and impair thinking, learning, and memory function. Which could hold us back from reaching our potential. Don't let marijuana mess with your brain. Get the facts at 
michigan.gov slash drug free. Who is struggling right now? I am. My son is. Many are struggling with anxiety, depression, and substance use. Before it becomes a crisis, reach out to MyCal, the Michigan Crisis and Access Line for free confidential support 24-7. Available in the Upper Peninsula in Oakland County. Just call or text 1-844-44-MyCal or chat online at michigan.gov slash MyCal. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith in the studios of our flagship stations, Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. And well, throughout the pandemic, people have continued to need to need their various forms of therapy, whether it be physical therapy, whether it be for their mental health, or even for things that we maybe not always think about, like our speech and language. And for that, we're pleased to be joined by our next guest. She is Dr. Alice Silbergleit. She is the speech language pathologist at Henry Ford Health System. Joining us now on the Oakland County Megacast, Dr. Silbergleit, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Appreciate having you on. For those that are unfamiliar, what does a speech pathologist do? We do a lot that <laughs> people don't even realize. We see individuals from birth to over 100 years old for a variety of reasons. We work with people with speech problems, so articulation, language problems, understanding what people say to you, uh, understanding what you read, saying words that make sense, being able to think of a word. We work with people with voice problems, people who've had perhaps a neurological disease or a medical disease that's affected their voice like Parkinson's disease, or they've had vocal cord cancer, or they've had a paralysis of their vocal cords. We work with people with cognitive disabilities. We work with children with articulation problems. Uh, we work with a wide variety of individuals with communication and swallowing disorders. So we diagnose the communication and swallowing disorder, and then we treat it. Dr. Ellis Silbergleit with us. She's a speech and language pathologist at Henry Ford Health System. And Dr. Silberg Silbergleit, you say you are, uh, that you're treating patients who are uh, who need th speech therapy from a variety of different issues, whether it just be natural issues with their speech, cognitive development issues, or uh, diseases such as Parkinson's. Is the treatment for each of these different, or are, or are they all pretty similar overall very, one to another? Very different. It would depend on what our testing showed, um, would depend on how we're going to treat that person. Every individual is different. One stroke patient could be very different from someone who had a stroke in a different part of their brain. Um, someone in a relatively the same stage of Parkinson's disease may have a quieter voice than someone in that same stage. So it is remarkable that uh, there is no cookie cutter method. We really uh, have to individualize our treatment depending on what our testing has shown to promote the best, most optimum way for that person to communicate and swallow. We work with swallowing also. Dr. Alice Silbergleit with us from Henry Ford Health System. She's one of their speech pathologists. And uh, you know, the, that can come with a lot of th those variables in treatment for different kinds of people with different conditions and different needs for how they improve their speech and their swallowing can lead to a, a number of different therapies that may be really interesting or really experimental and help a number of people. And, and that brings me to our, my next question for you about an effort that's been that you have been involved in uh, creating a therapeutic choir called the Motor City Upbeats. Can Tell us a little bit about what the Motor City Upbeats do. I would be happy to. We are a therapeutic choir, as you mentioned, and I started the choir in the spring of 2019, having worked with individuals with a variety of neurological and medical disorders for many years, and I was particularly thinking about my patients who have Parkinson's disease who have a very low vocal volume. And if a patient has a low vocal volume, it's very difficult for other people to hear them. And when they can't be heard, they tend to stay quiet and not speak and become socially isolated. And I was really trying to prevent that with my patients. I discovered that they did very well in voice therapy. They came to me four days a week, let's say for a month, they were doing really, really well, speaking louder, more articulate, and then I would see them back for a follow-up visit in about a month, 
and they would have subjectively regressed. I would test their volume with a sound level meter that would have gone down. And what I heard over and over again was that they didn't really have anyone to speak to. Um, they no longer had the accountability of coming to me every day for therapy. So they weren't practicing. And I thought that it was a shame and we needed to think about ways to carry over voice therapy into a fun and social and um, active environment with some emotional support with people around them who were perhaps undergoing the same kinds of things. So I started to do a little bit of research and saw that um, there were some choirs that had started with individuals with Parkinson's disease with a very um, beginning pilot data. And I thought that we would try it. So I, I'm a voice therapist, but I'm not a singer. So I um, searched for a singer and found Elizabeth Escada, who is a vocal performer in the Detroit area who has a master's in music. And so Liz and I have partnered to uh, create this choir. I teach her some voice therapy techniques based on the patient's medical diagnosis. She incorporates them into singing exercises. And so that's really how the choir started. We were meeting in person once a week, but then since the pandemic in March of 2020, we've all been on Zoom. So when did the choir start meeting, Dr. selberg -Light? March of 2019. And up until this point, uh, not, not including the uh, the effects the pandemic may have had on the, each individual member of the choir. What, are, what results have you seen from your patients and their participation in the Motor City Upbeats? That's a great question. We have seen very subjective anecdotal results right now. One of my goals is in the process of writing up what's called an IRB to do research on the choir to look at patient reported outcomes. And patients, well, just to give you an idea, we have a married couple in the choir who travel over an hour each way wow. to participate once a week because we've gone back to once a week now since our members are vaccinated and comfortable singing outside with a little distance. So it's meant a lot to them. And anecdotally, I've heard from a patient's wife that her husband with Parkinson's disease is louder at family gatherings and he's not choking as often, which is something I intend to research about singing and swallowing. And the overwhelming theme the patients say is that they speak louder in crowds with their family. People don't have to ask them to repeat as often and they feel better about themselves. And they're really part of this singing community now of people with perhaps a variety of medical problems, but they're all supporting each other. They're all working on their breath support. We have patients post COVID in the choir we're having difficulty breathing, and they use the singing exercises to help with posture, breath support, vocal range, endurance. We're joined by Dr. Alice silberg on the Oakland County Megacast, a speech and language pathologist at Henry Ford Health System. And uh, you mentioned earlier on that, that uh, throughout the pandemic, the choir has been meeting over Zoom. Have they had any in-person meetings over the last several months as things started to begin to open back up? Are you still meeting over Zoom? We're doing a hybrid. So we do Zoom once a week and in person once a week. We actually sang the national anthem at the Michigan Parkinson Foundation kickoff okay. walk fundraiser a few weeks ago. So we had to practice in person because if you know that in Zoom to have two people talking at once just doesn't work. So we have been back in person. We are now talking about having either an outdoor performance for choir members and their families or perhaps doing um, producing a video of the choir, which will bring us back in person again, because people really loved being in person. You can really, you can hear the music better, you can hear yourself, you can hear each other around you, and you know um, to work on that timing of singing and just participating in more of a community way than being individualized on Zoom. So they both work. We have patients, we have, I'm sorry, choir members who live out of state who join. So obviously we're gonna keep the Zoom once a week so we can still engage those members.
Now, the Star Spangled Banner, the uh, national anthem, that's not an easy song for anybody, even the best of the best of singers, uh, to, to perform. Why choose that song for the performance at the Parkinson's Foundation event? We were asked to sing, okay. to kick it off with the national anthem, and I will tell you, everyone rose to the occasion. It was fantastic. Yeah. It was really beautiful and sounded great. I'll send you a video. <laughs> yeah, our, uh, our producer Larry sent a video uh, to me yesterday of it that he found on social media and uh, okay. it, it, was, it was fantastic. It was a really nice performance. Uh, we're joined by Dr. Alice Silberglight. She's the speech and language pathologist at Henry Ford Health System. Joining us on the Oakland County Megacast, also one of the leaders of the Motor City Upbeats Choir as well. And so as you're meeting over Zoom and you're, and you're using music as a form of therapy with these patients with a number of different issues that they're trying to work through and improve on doing that over zoom even individually one-to-one -one and, and then in a group setting has to be di difficult and has to have a lot of different variables involved was it how did you navigate not only that situation but also um, holding the choir and, and holding the, this form of therapy over zoom over the course of this pandemic well liz is really creative and she's a great choir director and so she found um, she found lyrics and YouTube videos of the songs that we choose. And we choose, we collaborate on roughly a six week session. What are we gonna focus on this time? Is it going to be harmonizing, which we really can't do on Zoom? Um, is it going to be frequency range, getting the vocal range more expanded? So what would happen is during the Zoom choir session, Liz shares her screen and the lyrics are on the screen for patients, for members, I'm sorry, I'm at work, I keep saying patients, for members to pay attention to. And we have some members of the choir who have musical backgrounds who wanted a little bit more advanced musicality to the choir. And so we have some of the screen sharing for Thursdays, which is a little bit more uh, of a musicality session. Tuesday is more music basic skills. Thursday is a little bit more involved, has sight reading of music. So some people wanted the notes, they wanted to be able to sight read. And so it's very, actually, it's very easy to do on Zoom and just with screen sharing and engaging people, perhaps asking people, okay, now this group mute themselves, this one unmute, let's, and they don't have to. If someone doesn't want to be heard, they can stay muted the whole time. There's no pressure. If you just want to mute yourself and kick back in your house and practice the exercises without anyone hearing you, that was actually one of the advantages of being on Zoom is that you could mute yourself. So it ended up working very well. Well, that, that is great to hear that, that, that so many people are having a, a great impact on their progress as they're going through these therapies through the Motor City Upbeats. And so the, Dr. Alice Silberglight joining us on the Oakland County Megacast, speech language pathologist at Henry Ford Health System. Uh, I, I know from my notes from our producer, Larry, uh, that there's a, there's a connection between hand signals that are being used and the songs themselves. Can you talk about that connection and how maybe that helps each of these people that are members of the Upbeats in their, in their progress forward while also helping the choir come together and, and perform great music. Yes, so we challenge our members and Liz and I are always collaborating about what is the best way to not only work on aerobics because singing is an aerobic activity. The breathing, the moving, the whole body is involved with singing, and so is your mind. When you're in a choral group and you start to sing, you have to increase your attention. You have to be aware of what people are saying around you and what you're saying. So now, in order to challenge the cognitive load a little bit, we might add finger snapping in a certain type. We might add foot tapping. Uh, many, Most of our members are seated during choir practice, whether it's live or at home on Zoom. Some have walkers and wheelchairs and they're seated. However, we incorporate body movements to a seated position. And then we add extra layers of cognitive load. So whether it is a body movement or perhaps we're singing in person, we've done singing in a round format. So now you really have to pay attention. When do I chime in? When is it my part to start uh, singing? And so it's multitasking and it's
it's challenging people's brains, attention, and memory. People, uh, the choir members, will know what the, not assignment, but what the plan is for the next session. And so perhaps they're practicing their lyrics. They're thinking about music. They're planning ahead. They're sequencing how they're going to sing. They're thinking about body mechanics. And so we're incorporating all kinds of executive functioning with planning and sequencing and organization and memory, along with aerobic activity and having fun at the same time, because it really is all about being together and uh, just enjoying singing and working on the things that uh, just aren't functioning the same way as they used to pre-medical condition or any other condition. We're joined by Dr. Alice Silberg Light from Henry Ford Health System here on the Oakland County Megacast. Dr. Silberg Light, just another couple of minutes with you before we have to say goodbye. If somebody is interested in either joining the Motor City Upbeats themselves or maybe a family member or a friend of theirs they think would be uh, would, would get some benefit from joining this group, how can they find more information and maybe potentially even join the Motor City Upbeats? We would love to have new members. Uh, the best way to reach out is going to henryford.com slash upbeats. And that will take you to um, a Facebook page. And I will also give you my department phone number if people have questions, okay. 248-661-7241. And I would like to mention that due to the generosity of an anonymous donor, the choir is free. There is no charge to join. Again, that number is 248-661-7241 if you are interested. Dr. Silberg, thank you very much for joining us thank on today's MechaCast. Thank you very much. Appreciate having you on. Dr. Alice Silberglight, speech language pathologist at Henry Ford Health System, joining us on today's edition of the Oakland County Megacast. You're listening to the Oakland County Megacast on your radio homes for the show, 89.3 WBLD, Orchard Lake, West Bloomfield, Keego Harbor, Sylvan Lake, 89.3, Lakes FM, live streaming online on lakesfm.com at a service of the Greater West Bloomfield Cable Communications Commission, as well as on 88.1 WBLD. FH Bloomfield Hills, a service of the Bloomfield Hills School District. We're going to take a quick break, and then the second hour of the show, a lot of more interesting information to go over. Next, we'll be speaking with Oakland County Water Resources Commissioner Jim Nash. We'll also speak with Senator Gary Peters, as well as Wald Lake School Superintendent Ken Gutman. All of that coming up after this quick break. You're watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast on our family of television, radio, and other media outlets. Motorcyclists are hard to see. To keep everyone safer, it's important to always look for them and know where most crashes occur. 84% of motorcycle and vehicle crashes happen on streets, not highways. And most crashes with motorcyclists occur when vehicle drivers are turning left. So before turning, especially to the left, make sure you look for motorcyclists. Then look again. It could save a life. Sophia and Gabriel. Even though these old knees can't follow on your adventure to the forest today, these flowers represent my love. These stitches and threads join us together. And wherever you see a flower, a bird, a beautiful tree, know that my love is with you. Make the forest part of your story at a park near you. Find one at discovertheforest.org. You see certain things get reincarnated in your children. My daughter is very much inspired by my wife's artistic pursuits. So my daughter started making necklaces. She makes what we call affirmation fashion. I tell her every day that your black is beautiful. Your black is beautiful. Your black is beautiful. And if there's anything better than being beautiful, it's being smart. If there's anything better than being smart, it's being kind. And reaffirming that every day is our method of making sure her chin never drops. My dad wasn't around. And I remember riding a bike and falling off and cutting myself. And me never just wanted to get back on it. People ask, how your children learn how to ride a bike? And you did. I didn't teach them. I just created an environment where they taught themselves. And all I had to do was be there.
Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith in the studios of our flagship stations, 89.3 Lakes FM and Civic Center TV. We're also joined by a number of other media outlets, including 88.1 WBFH, the Biff, Birmingham Area Municipal Access, and My Michigan Television, or My My, joining us for the first time on today's edition of the Oakland County Megacast as we continue to provide information about a variety of different of different news and top stories around the local area. And, and over the past several weeks, we've had a number of once in a hundred year floods, uh, a number of major storms throughout our local area that's taken a toll on so many communities, particularly those downriver in the Detroit area, right around Dearborn and so on, and have had a major impact on our water systems as well. We'll talk more about that. Let's bring in Oakland County Water Resources Commissioner Jim Nash with us now on the Oakland County Mega cast Jim thank you for being with us today good morning thanks for having me thanks for being on the show so Jim over the last few weeks with all these storms it's really taken a, a significant toll on our communities particularly with the flooding how have these storms been affecting our water systems especially in response to these storms and trying to recover but then having another one come in after and another one come in after and just having these repeat uh, bombardments of water in our communities Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I've, I've lived here coming on 30 years. My wife grew up here, you know, a while ago. <laughs> and this is this is a whole different way, uh, you know, a whole different weather patterns than we've ever experienced um, in the past. Uh, the, the universities of Michigan um, have a consortium studying climate change, and this is all part of climate change. What's going to affect us most in this re Great Lakes region is going to be extreme rain events uh, and storms. Um, so this is something that's going to be coming. And this is, you know, a warning year. This is the wettest I've ever seen in my life. Um, I, uh, I, I lived in Florida for 15 years and the soil is more wet here permanently this summer than I've ever experienced. Um, I can't even get my lawnmower to the front of my house because it's landlocked. I can't get past all the, the, the swamp in my backyard. So um, the ground is so saturated that every rain that's coming doesn't have a chance to go into the ground. It just comes right off it in sheets. So this is affecting uh, combined sewer systems uh, like in, in Detroit um, and some of you know Oaks, uh, the bottom part of Oakland County. Uh, we're not aware of any flooding events in our systems in Oakland County, but they got way more uh, rain in that storm, uh, gosh, two weeks ago now. Um, they got uh, seven inches in some places. Uh, we got up to four inches in parts of Oakland County. Um, but again, this is on top of previous rains, so all of that is coming off. None of that is really getting absorbed into the ground. So that's why we're experiencing much more flooding events from, from uh, the same amount of rain that in normal conditions wouldn't cause flood events. Well, J Jim Nash, Oakland County Water Resources Commissioner with us on the show. And, and Jim, maybe it's just a re repeated nature of these major storms and this major flooding over the, s the past several weeks that's increased the frustration. But you mentioned climate change. It's not just climate change that's a problem here. It's also just the general infrastructure of our local area here in southeastern Michigan and, and throughout the state of Michigan as well that's seen the toll being being taken on it and has been really impacting a lot of families, especially in areas like De Dearborn and especially down river in places like Detroit as well. Our infrastructure, frankly, to, 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 put, it, to put it lightly, stinks and climate change is not really going to help with, it's not going to be a help of that going forward. So what are organizations like, like yours, the, and the Oakland uh, County Water Resources Commission, with partnerships like, with GLEWA and with the state of Michigan and so on, doing to plan going forward to not only combat climate change at the state level, but to combat what impact climate change is going to ultimately continue to have on these systems that are at play? Absolutely. So. Um, the, the large systems that carry uh, water and sewage to Detroit for treatment, for other things like that, um, are, are not as old as the, the, the community systems in a lot of our communities. Um, Pontiac system, uh, a lot of the pipes underground are between 80 and 120 years old. So um, that, that the age of those pipes makes it more likely when there are events that there will be issues with the infrastructure. Um, we invest in that. We have a 20-year, we're, we're like four years now in the 20-year plan to uh, to replace a huge chunk of the infrastructure in Pontiac with much more 
uh, with newer, much more advanced infrastructure that, that should be more capable of handling these long-term storms. The problem is that this also affects uh, the affordability in a lot of communities. Like in Detroit, um, they, 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 if they had the uh, unlimited resources, they could have invested a lot more in, in, in getting rid of these uh, older infrastructure issues that they have. But unfortunately, um, if it, the only way until recently was to, to build the ratepayers for it. So their water was already unaffordable. If they did the huge investments they need to do only on the backs of ratepayers, it would make it impossible for a lot of people to afford water. So right now we have several potential inputs of money for infrastructure that we really, really need. I've expressed it directly to Senator Peters, uh, um, our Congress folks, um, in every direction I can. Uh, there's, there's potential now for funding from the county, from the uh, American Recovery Act, um, that we're looking to try to spend in some of our communities that are in desperate need of help. Um, and we're looking at this infrastructure bill that's coming, that we can use this money to do the work we need to do without hitting the ratepayers so hard. So this is something that we really need to be investing in strongly. Um, I've talked to folks from the state level, the federal level. They're very interested in doing this. We already have some uh, state and local funds that are available that we're looking to, to, uh, to tap into to do these kind of works, to replace these water mains, these sewer mains, and the combined sewer systems uh, in some areas. We're also working with Detroit. We're, we're, we're working in a project, so we're going to allow more flow from one of our uh, uh, separated sewer systems into Detroit for cleaning and invest about $35 million in green infrastructure in Detroit itself to limit about 100 million gallons of rainwater that gets into that combined system that causes these overflows. So we're, we're looking to use green infrastructure. This is the way of mimicking how water is absorbed in nature um, to limit how much gets into our stormwater system. So long term, these are the things that need to be done. We're working with local communities. We're working with our regional partners and our state and federal partners to make this happen. And this funding opportunity that's coming is, is incredibly important to get this done. So um, we're really pushing hard for this. We need to get these works done. Like you said, between the combination of infrastructure uh, ages and issues and the coming of climate change, bringing more storms, this is something that has to be done. If we don't, we're going to be left with more disasters in the future. So, uh, and it's not just us. You remember four or five years ago now, um, up in the UP, yeah. uh, Houghton got hit by a storm that destroyed roads, bridges, downtowns. It had a huge effect on local infrastructure with a very unurbanized area. So this affects all of us in this region and in, in this whole, you know, Great Lakes Basin. With, with, with what's going on right now, Jim Nash, Oakland County Water Resources Commission, commis, Commissioner, joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. With what's going on, on right now, people want solutions and people want to see that there's some progress being made, even as we're looking at this potential funding coming in. But we, frankly, we don't know necessarily if we're going to get that funding or to what extent we are going to get that. So while that is being discussed at multiple levels, statewide, federally, so on and so forth, what is being done at the local level, particularly here in Oakland County, to work to mitigate these issues in a way that is still affordable and is not going to make a major hit on the taxpayers in order to do a major overhaul necessarily, but helps to mitigate these problems and maybe prevent severe outcomes because of these storms that are coming in. I got you. Okay, so um, the way all this is done is uh, each individual community has their, their ordinances, their, their processes, all the things they mm -hmm. do. Um, like with, with the, uh, the 14 communities that, that uh, have contribute flow to the George W. Kuhn Retention Treatment Basin, that's a combined sewer system in the southeastern corner of the county. Um, we've worked with all those communities to, uh, to develop their, uh, their development ordinances, to uh, include green infrastructure, to include ways of people when they're developing, redeveloping land, to put things in as part of that process to limit how much water gets off their properties. And they can often use that water themselves for irrigation later. You know, they can collect it in basins uh, and then use it for watering their, their lawns and plants. And there's all kinds of uses they can get out of this. And when, when you're doing that, it limits how much gets into that system every time it rains. 
Um, so again, communities are doing that all over the all over Michigan and the, and the Great Lakes uh, region because of this impact of climate change. Um, and at the same time, um, this is more, uh, uh, it's cheaper to put in, it's cheaper to operate and maintain over time because you're not putting in giant things underground, uh, pipes and pumps and tanks and things that, that gray infrastructure has to deal with. Um, so you're limiting what's get into those systems. Um, and that in smaller storms, that limits pollution because pollution comes off uh, of, un, of separated stormwater systems. Um, and uh, if, you can, if you can limit how much gets into our lakes, rivers, and streams, that helps the health of those lakes, rivers, and streams. Um, so at the same time, we're looking to, to mitigate climate change by using less uh, um, carbon intensive and methane intensive um, power. Uh, I'm, I'm at, a, at a Pontiac plant up, uh, that serves 13 communities now, uh, their wastewater treatment plant. Uh, we put in a new system that takes uh, the, the sewage solids that we normally would landfill for a, a million or $2 a, a, a year um, would now we're, we're turning them into methane in a process called uh, anaerobic digestion and uh, thermal hydrolysis. We're taking almost all of the energy available from those solids out of it in terms of methane in a closed system. So we're going to get entirely off of fossil fuels and use the solids that we are already processing to run that plant and potentially run a fleet of vehicles, uh, compressed uh, natural gas vehicles from that getting vehicles and all our plants off of fossil fuels, which is what contributes to climate change. So there's lots of things my industry can do to help climate change uh, resiliency and mitigation. And I'm, I'm pushing that as hard as I can and regionally and statewide, that's something that's really coming into focus now. Jim Nash was with us on the Oakland County Megacast. He's the Oakland County Water Resources Commissioner. And, and Commissioner, as you talk about green solutions that are being planted, being put in place, uh, not only on individual community levels, but being suggested and being assisted by the Water Resources Commission as well to help mitigate some of these issues, what can the average person, the average taxpayer, expect to see as, as far as results from putting these green solutions in place, how much of an impact can green solutions have on preventing severe outcomes from these 100-year floods, from these major storms that come through, as opposed to or in, or, or, um, in absence of revamped systems or those uh, gray infrastructure systems? Well, like I said, we have to kind of do both. We have to we have to concentrate on on really two things: fixing those systems we have and making them capable of holding more water in the long term as these storms get bigger. Um, and at the same time, building green infrastructure. Uh, uh, individuals can do that. Um, you know, you have something called rain gardens. Uh, you have mm -hmm. rain barrels that can hold water. Um, for you can use for your own land, uh, you know, uh, irrigation. And then once the storm's over, you just open the tap, let it slowly come out instead of being part of that storm flow. Um, there's there's lots of things people can do. People, anybody that lives on a lake, river, or stream, it's called riparian land, where your 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 land is right up against water. You can put something called a riparian buffer in it. If you grow your lawn right up to the shore, and then every time it rains, if you, anything you fertilize that lawn with gets right in that water. That's what creates algae and, and bacterial blooms. It closes beaches. It causes all kinds of issues around that. So if you live on that kind of properties, you can put in a little buffer, a little four foot strip of, of more absorbent land that you put in native plants that have very deep roots. So when it comes off that lawn, instead of going right into the water, it gets absorbed into the ground in those roots. And it, all those uh, you know, fertilizers don't grow the algae and, and bacteria in the water. Um, if you put in a rain garden, uh, some communities are doing what's called um, utilities, stormwater utilities. So instead of just part of your water bill or part of your tax base, um, each home is rated on how much water comes off that property. And then if you, you pay for that much water, so your share of how, what it costs to, to run a system. Um, but then if you put in things like rain gardens and rain barrels and things that hold that water on your property, then you would have to pay less for that for that stormwater fee because you're not producing as much water into the system as you used to. And every tent, every property owner that connects less into the system means there's less water coming into that in a flood condition. Um, if we can get entire communities to do those kind of green infrastructure projects, then we're going to have project. We will have much less impact of these storms on our existing gray infrastructure. 
So we have to do both. We have to work on the gray infrastructure using this infrastructure funding that we're, we're looking to, to, uh, to gain. And we have to make sure that we do these green infrastructure processes uh, both uh, you know, individually as businesses, as communities, and, and develop these ways of limiting how much stormwater gets into our systems in a storm. And again, whether it's, uh, if it's a combined system in, Mich in Oakland County, all of our combined systems are treated. The water that's released is cleaner than the water that's already in those uh, rivers. And um, what we're doing to is, is uh, the most impact of stormwater is in these separated stormwater systems. There's no cleaning, nothing happens. It goes right off the roads and parking lots into the nearest lake, river, and stream, carrying with it everything, uh, oil, gas, brake dust, all those things. So we have to make sure that what we're doing is having, not going to have an impact in the future. That's sustainability, and that's what I base my decisions on. We're joined by Jim Nash here on the Oakland County Megacast. He's the Oakland County Water Resources Commissioner. Jim, just another 30 seconds or so with us. Anything else that would be important for our audience to know today? You know, if, if you're having issues, uh, let us know. If there's basement flooding, um, you need to report to your community and to my office within uh, 45 days if you've had some kind of basement incident. Uh, please don't hesitate to do that. Um, if, if there's an issue that is in our system, uh, we, we're responsible for that. If it's not us or if it's something that's, you know, an overwhelming amount of water, um, that's, that's something we'll have to look for in the future. And we're looking to make sure that people are protected as these storms increase in volume over the years. We want to make it less likely for people to get flooded. So that's our guiding principle. Well, Jim, we thank you very much for joining us on today's show. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Jim Nash, Oakland County Water Resources Commissioner with us on the Oakland County Megacast. We're going to take a quick break. When we return on the other side, we'll be speaking with U.S. Senator Gary Peters. You're watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast. Here's one more reason to get the COVID-19 vaccine. It's your shot to win. Anyone 18 years or older in Michigan vaccinated between December 1st, 2020 and July 30th, 2021 is now eligible to win millions in cash prizes, including million dollar jackpots and $50,000 daily prizes. And vaccinated students could win thousands in college scholarships. For eligibility details and to enter, go to mishottowin.com. Can I ask you a question? Why did you get your kids vaccinated? It was hard for them to social distance, to be isolated from their friends. I want them to get back to school and sports games. So as a pediatrician, I recommend the vaccine to everyone I know. The boys lost a former teammate and classmate who was only 20 years old. It's been a devastating year. We want to get back to normalcy. Our daughter is really looking forward to being with her friends, being a kid. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keeft in the studios of Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM in West Bloomfield. We thank you for joining us on, on these channels and throughout the local area on a number of television, radio, and other media outlets. Let's go straight into our next interview and welcome in U.S. Senator Gary Peters to the show. Senator Peters, thank you for being with us on the program today. Well, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. Appreciate having you on. Let's start off uh, and continue on with the conversation we had with Oakland County Water Resources Commissioner Jim Nash, as we've had a number of 100-year floods and major storms here in the local area over the past several weeks, and we've seen clear and present issues with our infrastructure here in the state of Michigan. What is being discussed at the federal level from your office and with your colleagues in Congress about mitigating those issues here in the state of Michigan as it's having an impact not only here in southeastern Michigan, but across our state over the past several years. Well, you're right. It's a, it's a significant impact. Commissioner Nash talked about that. I, I caught the, the tail end of, of that interview, and certainly I know he's focused on addressing the problem. Uh, and the, it, really, bottom line, it's a, a result of what we're seeing with climate change and the fact that we know that storms will be increasing uh, in intensity, uh, as well as the number of those. As you mentioned, we've had a number of uh, very large uh, events, and we need to be in a position to, to mitigate that. Certainly, we have to deal with, with climate change broadly if, if up front, so we don't continue to see the escalation of these uh, very damaging storms, but uh, they are going to be with us going forward, and we have to plan accordingly. 
The infrastructure package that's before the Senate uh, right now, in fact, we just uh, moved uh, yesterday to a uh, motion to proceed as we continue to debate it. We'll deal with a, a, this issue in a number of ways, although I'm happy to say that one of the pieces of legislation that I worked on and passed uh, last year to create uh, a storm act, which will provide uh, low to no, very, very low interest loans to communities uh, that they can use to build greater resiliency to deal with these storms, particularly the flooding or the high water levels we're seeing uh, across the, the state of Michigan to make those kinds of investments to, to make it more resilient. And it shows the numbers are are compelling in terms of an investment. For every $1 you invest in these resilient program to deal with floods, saves taxpayers $6 overall, because if you have to go back and make the fixes after a storm occurs, it's a whole lot more expensive. And when you increase the number, it's gonna be even more so. So this is a good investment. Uh, I author, We had that authorization passed. I passed it on a bipartisan way last year. And in this infrastructure package that's before us right now, there's $500 million of funding funding uh, for it uh, being put in. Uh, and that 500 million is a revolving fund. So when communities pay it back, it's available for another community. It's gonna be there for years to come to help us deal with it. And it's certainly one way the federal government uh, will uh, is working to complement what we're seeing at the state and local level and certainly complement what Commissioner Nash is uh, doing in Oakland County. Senator Gary Peters with us on the Oakland County Megacast, our US Sen one of our two U.S. Senators for the state of Michigan. And, and as we've seen with these past storms and over the past several years, the impact that other storm systems and other effects of climate change have had throughout the state of Michigan, how much more important now than ever is it for an infrastructure package like, like the one that's being discussed currently or in another form gets through and gets through quickly so that our communities can start addressing clear and present issues, not only with climate change, but with the infrastructure and the impact that climate change has had on those outdated systems that are still in place. Well, you're absolutely right about outdated systems and the fact that we have just underinvested for far too long when it comes to critical infrastructure. If, if you look at infrastructure broadly uh, uh, with physical infrastructure from roads uh, to bridges uh, to underground infrastructure, uh, et cetera, uh, the, the folks who look at this, uh, the engineers who look at this and, and actually rank countries based on the quality of our infrastructure uh, and various countries around the world, Right now, the United States is ranked 13 on the list, 13. That's simply unacceptable to me. This is the United States of the Amer of America. We need to have world-class uh, infrastructure. Uh, we need to be number one, not number 13th, and it shows that we just have not made these investments. This infrastructure package, the, the bipartisan one, as well as a, another bi uh, infrastructure package we hope to pass on the heels of this, will make substantial investments to upgrade roads and, and bridges and other critical infrastructure, including high-speed uh, internet, which is uh, critically important for uh, all of us, uh, particularly uh, in this new internet age. And we saw with the pandemic, the great gaps that exist uh, with access to high-speed internet, that's gonna be addressed uh, in this uh, package, as well as infrastructure to move to a cleaner economy. Uh, we know that General Motors and, and Ford and our other manufacturers are moving aggressively to electrify the fleet. Uh, electrical, uh, moving towards electric vehicles uh, will take us uh, in large measure in the right direction uh, for a cleaner economy. And a part of this uh, package is to put in charging stations uh, across the country so that people know that they, as these uh, vehicles become more available through our local domestic manufacturers, that there'll be charging stations uh, as well. So this is a pretty comprehensive approach to what is clearly a very significant challenge. Senator Peters, you're also the chairperson of the Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee uh, as well. And, and we've heard a lot in the news recently about the formation of the January 6th commission to address the issues that happened, of course, on January 6th during the Capitol insurrection while the um, Electoral College results were being certified by both chambers of Congress. Uh, we hear a lot about that in the news. I know that you're short on, on time today. So just briefly, as we uh, wrap this up, can you explain for our viewers and for your constituents here in the state of Michigan, beyond just understanding what went on on that day, what are the other purposes of this commission? 
Well, the commission uh, that I uh, spearheaded uh, in a bipartisan way, two committees, my committee as chairman of Homeland Security Committee and, and the Rules Committee, was to look at the events that day. Uh, what were the security lapses, uh, intelligence uh, lapses? Uh, uh, why was not the National Guard able to respond uh, more quickly? Basically looking, uh, for in a fairly narrow sense, exactly what happened on that day. We came up with over 20 recommendations uh, that need to be implemented immediately. Uh, many of those uh, are going to be part of a supplemental package that's going to come uh, before the, the Senate, uh, hopefully in the next uh, few hours or days uh, to address some of that. But there's still more work to do. One thing that we found through our work in Homeland Security were intelligence lapses, that the intelligence community did not provide information to the folks on the ground in a timely way, even though it was apparent. Uh, it, this, was, this was an attack that was planned on the internet. There were, uh, it was clear, and we had uh, the former president caught talking to the people that come to Washington, it's going to get wild. And he was putting out the big lie to get people riled up. And we knew that folks uh, were talking to each other on the internet. They were coming here to disrupt the constitutional process of the peaceful transfer of uh, power. Uh, and yet that information did not get to where it had to get to as quickly as it should have. Uh, we've got to make sure this never, ever happens again. That we do. Senator Peters, thank you very much for joining us today. We know that you're short on time. But we appreciate you making time for us here at the MechaCast. Good to be with you. Thank you. Absolutely. Senator Gary Peters, U.S. Senator, joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. We're going to take another quick break. And on the other side, we'll talk more about the state of Michigan, a new app that is available that provides you programming that gives you a scope of all of the state of Michigan. That coming up next on the Oakland County Megacast. And then to wrap up the show, we'll be speaking with Wild Lake School Superintendent Ken Gutman. You're watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast on our family of television, radio, and other media outlets. The Megacast returns after this. Can I ask you a question? Why did you get vaccinated? I'd like to go to these school dances and spring break to have fun. I want to be in person for college next semester. I want to get out of this pandemic. I wanted to protect the people around me. Why did you get vaccinated? Because I'm really looking forward to hanging out with my friends. I just want to go to a show, dance around, not have to worry about anything, feel like I'm free again. So we can not miss out on the best years of our life. How does marijuana affect the teen brain? Our brains are still developing into our 20s. With regular use, marijuana can affect teen brain development. It can affect our brain's circuitry and blood flow and impair thinking, learning, and memory function. Which could hold us back from reaching our potential. Don't let marijuana mess with your brain. Get the facts at michigan.gov slash drug free. Here's one more reason to get the COVID-19 vaccine. It's your shot to win. Anyone 18 years or older in Michigan vaccinated between December 1st, 2020 and July 30th, 2021 is now eligible to win millions in cash prizes, including million dollar jackpots and $50,000 daily prizes. And vaccinated students could win thousands in college scholarships. For eligibility details and to enter, go to mishottowin.com. Trevor Project is sharing how you can support LGBTQ youth who may be at risk. It's simple. Just show them that you care. C-A-R-E. Connect. If you noticed any warning signs of suicide from someone you know, reach out to them. Ask. Ask directly. Are you thinking about killing yourself? It might be challenging, but talking about suicide is proven to reduce risk. Respond. If they open up to you about their suicidal ideation, honor that trust by responding with compassion and empathy. Empower. Talking openly is a great first step, but now you can empower them with the information and the support they need to improve their situation. Learn more about how you can show them you care and help prevent LGBTQ youth suicide. Visit trvr.org slash care. To Sofia and Gabriel. Even though these old knees can't follow on your adventure to the forest today, these flowers represent my love. These stitches and threads join us together. And wherever you see a flower, a bird, a beautiful tree, know that my love is with you. Make the forest part of your story at a park near you. Find one at discovertheforest.org. People are getting out to walk and bike in higher numbers. More vulnerable road users and higher speed traffic can be a dangerous combination. 
crash severity has increased. So if you're driving, be sure to slow down and look for people. There's no need to speed. If you're biking, ride with traffic. If you're walking, avoid stepping into the road if possible. If you have to walk in the street, walk facing traffic. Learn more at walkbikedrivesafe.org. you can look for in your friends is a change in behavior. These can be big changes, they can be small changes in mood, physical appearance, they may be sleeping less or sleeping more, drinking more, or their eating patterns may be different. One big change that can be pretty obvious is change in motivation. Do they no longer want to play basketball? Do they no longer want to play video games? Now that we're spending more time online and in virtual settings, it's really important to pay attention to the language that your friend is using and the words they're using to communicate. So when we text our friends, are they taking longer amounts of time to respond? Are they not responding at all? You don't have to be an expert to try to recognize these signs. The second that you feel it in your gut and that you're concerned, that's a second to have the conversation and open the door to what might be going on. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith in the studios of Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. In addition, we're always on the Birmingham Area Municipal Access, 88.1 WBFH, the Biff, as well as on Facebook, facebook.com slash Civic Center TV. 15 and facebook.com slash lakes fm and for the first time this week we are now being joined by my michigan tv what is my, my michigan tv or my my that's a great question and here with all of the answers for that we are pleased to be joined by kevin walsh kevin thanks for being with us today well thanks tyler good to be here appreciate having you on so can you explain for us uh, for just a moment, what is My Michigan TV? Yeah, uh, My Michigan TV is actually uh, what's called uh, OTT video. It's an over the top platform, but most people would just know it if they've got any kind of streaming device, such as a Roku or Amazon Fire or anything like that, where you've got you know, on-demand videos and you can move through categories and little tiles move across the screen and things like that. But also, uh, My My TV has is, is got a couple live channels. So we've got a 24-7 stream of programming that's running, but we can cut it at any point like we're doing right now between 10 and 12 for uh, the Megacast to go on the air as well. So we are in a soft launch stage right now. So anybody watching, if they'd like to, they can go to their app store on uh, both uh, iOS and Android, also on Roku and Amazon and Apple TV, and just type in My Michigan TV, and uh, you can uh, see us as we're uh, getting things rolling and creating categories. And uh, we got we're gonna have reporters from across the state, college students, high school students, anybody who's interested in filming and telling us about their community. That's kind of what it's geared toward. So you mentioned that there's going to be a little bit of some news reporting from across mm -hmm. the state of Michigan that will be done by, by students and by other reporters as well. Mm -hmm. What other kinds of programming can people expect to see from around the state of Michigan on My Michigan TV? Well, we're looking to really feature the great things about the state. So it can be it can be travel, it can be food related. Uh, certainly you've got the whole micro microbrew industry that's uh, turned into a large industry here in Michigan. Uh, we're really kind of focus on uh, not just the people in Michigan learning about their own state, but there's a lot of people outside of Michigan that used to live in Michigan or they're wondering about Michigan. So we're going to, you know, feature documentaries and independent films and uh, lots of lots of live content and interviews. So, um, you know, we're looking for stories, we're looking for content and, uh, you know, we're looking for storytellers too. We're joined by Kevin Walsh from My Michigan TV. You can find that online, mymitv.com. And so for, for people that are wondering about this and are interested and want to see some of this, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that it is available on many of your smart TV mm -hmm. apps, such as your Roku mm -hmm. or Amazon Fire. What other devices can they find this programming on? Is it just on smart TVs or can it be on other devices as well? Yeah, it's also if you go into the Apple Store, you go into the Google Store inside of uh, both 
you know iOS and the Android platform. Uh, you can you can check it out that way, and also you can just watch it on your computer or your tablet. And the interface is uh, really clean. It's really uh, you know Dave Scott, our CEO, he's he's put a lot of time and investment into this to make this structure. And so we're reaching out to a lot of partners uh, to really help share their content as well. And perhaps you know folks may want their own station or their own row or or things like that. So it's uh, it's all very much in a very exciting uh, embryonic stage right now. And right now, is this a paid subscription base or is this a free program? To right now, it's free. Uh, there may be some content that at some point might be, you know, subscription. But right now, we just want to open it up to everybody and get as many subscribers and contributors as we can to really uh, share what's great about the state. We're joined by Kevin Walsh, producer at My Michigan Television, or My My, joining us on the Oakland County MechaCast. And Kevin, uh, there's a lot of great programming throughout the state of Michigan for Michiganders about the state of Michigan. What are some of the programs that are already on My Michigan TV, not including, of course, this great program here of ours that people can expect to find. Well, one of the things, uh, one of the things I produced that uh, you guys have been kind enough to feature here at Civic Center TV is a documentary series uh, I was a producer for called Digging Detroit. Mm -hmm. uh, those are about 18 episodes we made in 2015-16, and uh, it's, it's just historical pieces. Uh, we've got uh, some news reporting going on right now. Uh, Erica Jones, who's been on this show as well, she's mm -hmm. going around the state and doing stories. We've got, um, I've been reaching out to about 25 school districts to, as well as um, some colleges to share their content as well. So we really encourage you to go through and browse uh, Steve Lado, who's gonna be doing a live show uh, you know, from the Flint area, yeah. and he's a huge YouTuber. Uh, he, he created two really cool documentaries. He's a big car guy. He'll be down here for the Dream Cruise. But he, you know, he created some really cool videos about the turbine engine and, and things like that. And so, you know, the watch time that most people have on YouTube and Facebook Live is about two minutes, you know, they might do it. But when you're on a, a program like, uh, you know, Vimeo or, you know, something like that, you know, you may spend a little more time, but then when you leave, and you go to your streaming apps like Roku, uh, you know, people will get lost sometimes in a really cool uh, vortex of interesting videos that will link together. So part of my job is to create these categories and content and collections, a lot of C words there, and uh, really, you know, really get people kind of hooked on the state, and especially in areas that they may not have known much about: history, uh, restaurants, out of the uh, cool, out of the out of the way places, parks they've not been to, things like that. We're joined by Kevin Walsh here on the Oakland County Megacast, producer of My Michigan Television. You can find them on MyMyTV.com. As you see, us, our general manager, Dave Scott, here on your screen at Marquette Park in Mackinac Island mm -hmm. um, in, in a video here on their website. Really cool video there as well. You can find that on MyMyTV. And, and Kevin, you also m mentioned that, of course, uh, Erica Jones from our team has been doing some reports mm -hmm. throughout the state for My Michigan Television. Mm -hmm. If there are other student reporters or other mm -hmm. reporters uh, and independent journalists that would like to get involved mm -hmm. and do stories across the state of Michigan. How can they get involved with MyMy? My? Well, the, the quick email is just info at MyMyTV.com. That'll get us through. But also, uh, you know, they can feel free to, uh, if they subscribe to our channel, uh, they can reach out to us because they'll get an email back and that'll have an address. Uh, we are going to have a, uh, a website that's going to go with us, uh, go with this website, and there's going to be a lot of information. We're going to have uh, playlists on there, catalog uh, stories, but uh, a whole packet of resources for people that are interested in producing their own stories. Uh, you know, what's some good B-roll tips? What's How do you get a good interview? Where do you place the lights? Uh, things like that. As a video production teacher down the street at West Bloomfield, uh, you know, I taught in Southfield and West Bloomfield and Royal Oak. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, these are something that a lot of our, I was just talking last night to two teachers and they're thrilled about this because even if they're doing stories for their own school, they can repackage it and do an opening intro, outro that ties into my my as well. And they can also put it on our platform and it gives all these students a tremendous resume uh, you know a playlist uh, of their own and uh, you know it should be a really you know I think that's one of the cool things about Dave Scott's vision here is just how open it is and uh, we've had some great talks with museums and everybody everybody's going into it with a lot of excitement about sharing their material because some people have hundreds or even thousands of videos on YouTube for their museum but it's just a matter of how do people 
sift through it all. So we're thinking that this platform that many people are familiar with anyway with their streaming devices is really going to work well for, for all of them. Well, Kevin, we appreciate having you on with us today. Anything else that would be important for our audience to know about My My TV as they now join us here on the Megacast each day? Yeah, I would just encourage you to just you know download the app. Uh, if you, so if you just type in My Michigan TV in your app store, or if you go to uh, you know go to go to Roku, look it up on Roku or Amazon Fire or Apple TV, and pretty soon Samsung, uh, that'll get that'll get it to us, and you'll see it. That changes are immediate, and uh, we're gonna have a lot of great stuff on there. Well, Kevin appreciate it. Thank you very much for joining us. My Michigan TV. You can find more information at my M I my M I TV dot com. We're going to take a quick break here on the Oakland County Megacast and on the other side we'll switch from the entire state of Michigan to right here in the Wald Lake area and we'll be speaking with Wald Lake Schools Superintendent Ken Gutman. That coming up next. You're watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast. Here's one more reason to get the COVID-19 vaccine. It's your shot to win. Anyone 18 years or older in Michigan vaccinated between December 1st, 2020 and July 30th, 2021 is now eligible to win millions in cash prizes, including million dollar jackpots and $50,000 daily prizes. And vaccinated students could win thousands in college scholarships. For eligibility details and to enter, go to mishottowin.com. Today, it is easier than ever to join Michigan's organ donor registry and help build a bridge of hope for organ, tissue, and eye donation. Just one person can potentially save or help improve the lives of up to 75 people. By joining, your legacy could be the gift of life. Sign up today at michigan.gov SOS or at any of the more than 145 Secretary of State self-service stations located across Michigan. Be part of Michigan's Bridge of Hope by adding your name to the organ donor registry. How does marijuana affect the teen brain? Our brains are still developing into our 20s. With regular use, marijuana can affect teen brain development. It can affect our brain's circuitry and blood flow and impair thinking, learning, and memory function. Which could hold us back from reaching our potential. Don't let marijuana mess with your brain. Get the facts at michigan.gov slash drug free. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keeft in the studios of Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. We appreciate you joining us today, as always, on the Oakland County Megacast on our family of television, radio, and other media outlets as we continue to bring you news and information from a number of different areas all throughout the local area here in Oakland County and throughout the state of Michigan as COVID-19 continues to have an impact on all areas of our, of our lives, including on our kids' education. And to join us now for the last 15 15 minutes or so of the show. We are pleased to be joined once again by our good friend Ken Gutman, the superintendent of schools over in the Wald Lake Consolidated School District. Ken, thank you for being with us today. Tyler, it is always a pleasure to be here and uh, thanks for the invitation. Appreciate having you on. So uh, as we're continuing going through this summer and planning for the fall, uh, a few weeks ago, it was looking really, it was look, things were looking really up, really sunny for the fall as things began to reopen. COVID-19 cases were continuing to stay low in the state. Now it's a different situation as more concerns grow regarding the Delta variant. How has that impacted uh, or potentially changed plans in the Wald Lake Consolidated School District in anticipation for fall? Thank you, Tyler. You're leading with the, probably the question that's on most people's minds. We did send a letter home in the last couple of weeks letting parents know that we do fully intend to make masks optional. But when I say optional, I mean recommended but not required. It, it, semantics matter, words matter. Ultimately, we do recommend that people wear masks. We are not requiring them. Uh, but there have been changes over the last couple of weeks. To our knowledge, they haven't been significant. We're still not a high-risk state. I will say this, we monitor this daily. We watch the cases, we look for guidance from MDHHS and uh, obviously from the CDC. At this point, we are, uh, we are still looking at recommended, not required. We, we do have a, a call in to verify. We, we, we've been told that we, there's a belief that we do need to require masks on, on buses as public transportation. Okay. So we're seeking guidance on that and hope to give that to our community soon. 
Ken Gutman joins us on the Oakland County Megacast. He is the superintendent of the Wald Lake Consolidated School District. Uh, let's talk a little bit about vaccination as, as well. As we head into the, to the fall semester and uh, in-person learning will resume in Wald Lake in some capacity or another. Is there any discussions right now through the school district or any requirements that may be in place to require educators and or students to be vaccinated in order to return to the schools? No, I think what you'll find in just about every school district, if not every school district, is there is no requirement yeah. for vaccinations. This is a personal choice if people choose to be vaccinated. Certainly, uh, I, I understand the state may be at about 70% right now, which does help. But from the local level, from the school district level, no, we're not requiring vaccination. Uh, for those that may be interested, and I, I don't know if you maybe are able to dispel this information, uh, how is the vaccination rate throughout the employment base, uh, particularly the, the educators in your school district? Yeah, I, my understanding is it's very high. I would have to verify our latest numbers, but as of last spring, our, our understanding is our, the employees of the district it was a really high rate. We're joined by Ken Gutman here on the Oakland County Megacast, superintendent of the Wald Lake Consolidated School District. And as many school districts do over the summer, they make improvements to their buildings and prepare for, for the uh, best possible situation for their students, for their educators, and for their other faculty as well as they head into the fall. Um, Wald Lake has made a number of improvements as a result of $316 million in building infrastructure and equity bonds that were passed in November of 2019. What are some of those changes that families can expect to see throughout Wald Lake schools in the fall. Uh, we are so grateful to our community, Tyler, to pass such a, a large bond and a tax decrease, by the way. It's worth noting that we were able to raise that money while we're decreasing taxes from where they were. Uh, some improvements to the buildings provide equity uh, and access to buildings. So in, in some of our elementary schools, what you'll see is uh, uh, you'll see a gym addition in three of our elementary schools over the course of this bond. Those three, uh, th that brings them into an equitable situation with the rest of our elementary schools. You'll see a brand new Dublin Elementary School at the end of this bond. And if you've driven by Dublin Elementary and White Lake, the construction is ongoing. The new Dublin Elementary School is going to be a beautiful building. And it was being built on the same site as the current Dublin Elementary. We promise nothing but inconvenience over the next couple of years as we construct on the same site. But in the end, we'll have a great, great uh, setting for our students. We have a brand new Wald Lake Western High School, and not entirely we're, we're adding on, but significantly altering the look of Wald Lake Western. You'll see it be a more equitable building in terms of the uh, instructional delivery in other areas as our other two high schools. Also, what you'll see is a, a brand new early childhood center. We're very excited about this. If you drive down 13 mile road between Novi Road and M5, uh, it's coming up fast. We hope to have it sealed in soon, uh, closed off, the roof is up. And uh, this will give our youngest learners an opportunity to begin uh, in a really positive way in our district with our staff in one location or a couple of locations actually, but the primary location on 13 Mile Road will be a great start for our staff. One more, Tyler, and I don't want sure. to dominate everything we do here with this, but we're also going to make sure that every school has some upgraded systems, some of the not so sexy stuff, right? Some of HVAC, uh, that we're going to make sure that our roofs are in good repairs, and parking lots, uh, and also that we, we, we're replacing a, a lot of furniture throughout our schools to have more uh, collaborative types of settings for our students. We called it a, a little bit more of a Starbucks feeling in our classrooms and a lot of our classrooms, but kind of representing the work environments most people uh, encounter today, that they don't end up uh, sitting in rows in their work environment uh, fail facing forward. Education's changed in recent years, and, and we have seen in other school districts that have implemented such systems such as those that it has had an impact on the education of kids. So has COVID-19, so has the virtual learning over the past uh, year and a half or so that we've been involved in this pandemic. So as we're looking forward to the fall semester, what are some changes educationally that parents and students can expect as they return to the classroom? Sure, absolutely. So we offered a virtual option and uh, we did not have a huge response. I think a lot of people were ready to have their students come back uh, in person. Now, that doesn't mean everyone. Uh, at our secondary level, we have uh, seven secondary buildings, four middle schools and three high schools. And we had about 50-something parents who were interested in returning their students to virtual. The difficulty with that is it's really hard to staff at a secondary level with numbers that low. So we did offer a couple of options at the elementary and the secondary that go through Oakland schools. And so we are not directly running those, but we will have our staff involved in those programs. Uh, it's just, a, it becomes a staffing issue. 
A lot of people want to return in person, and we're going to accommodate that. Certainly, again, we're watching the numbers day by day, and we'll see what happens. Uh, it's our full intention to re return people back to in-person learning, to have a, a, a positive learning environment, and to uh, provide our children the very best education we can. Uh, Superintendent Gutman, are there any uh, are there any limitations or any uh, deadlines for parents and students if they do want to pursue either virtual education or in-person education for the fall that they need to let the school district know about? Yeah, we did, we did send something out a while ago with a deadline. The deadline has passed okay. for virtual, but certainly if someone wants to reach out to us and they're having some concerns, we're certainly willing to look at those on an individual basis to see if we can accommodate any requests. And, and we understand this. This is a fluid situation, Tyler. Yeah, and, and I know that uh, we've asked this in the in the past because it's got to be a concern going into this year, especially after we've seen, uh, in some ways, the smoothness and in some ways, uh, not smoothness of of hybrid learning. What's going to have to happen with snow days in the next school year? Are we still going to have snow days, or are those going to be sudden virtual days? Now you're asking the tough, important question students want to know. Uh, yeah, I, so. There is something to be said about the traditional snow day, and there are points of the year where everybody really could use a break. My intention is if we're going to have some snow days, potentially if the weather it justifies them. However, if you get severe weather for a week, two weeks, I think, you know, long periods or multiple days, then it's time to start looking at some hybrid learning and make sure we can provide education for our students. Uh, I, I'm not opposed to a couple of days of snow days, but I also don't want to lose the instructional opportunities we have. Uh, and, to sp and to speak about uh, opportunities and potential for lost opportunities, over the course of the pandemic, many school districts, including yours, did provide some technological systems to students and families that maybe didn't have uh, equitable access to the internet or to computers in order to continue their education. And in today's modern education, the internet and computers and other devices are critical to the edu to education. What is the Walled Lake School District doing, if anything, to continue going forward, helping these families as they're coming out of the pandemic continue to have access potentially to those to the, that technology and to the internet in order to put their best foot forward so their kids can get as great of an education as possible in Wal Walled Lake? Now, the equity of access is a huge deal. We want to make sure that we have opportunities for each and every one of our students, regardless of, of other conditions in their lives. Ultimately, we've retained the devices we used last year. We're cert we certainly will have them available, and uh, we'll work through our principals to make sure that there's an equitable distribution when necessary. Ken Gutman joins us on the Oakland County Megacast, the superintendent of the Wald Lake Consolidated School District. And as people return to the classroom, some people in the Wald Lake School District are exiting. And one of those people that are that are leaving is longtime employee, 19-year employee, Judy Evola, who is the longtime director of community relations and marketing for the Wald Lake Consolidated School District. Uh, Ken, anything that you want to say about her service to the school district over the nearly 20 years she has been with Wald Lake? Yeah, thank you for that opportunity. We, we had an opportunity to celebrate her as we closed out the year, but I, 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 I can't thank her enough. Judy Avola was a fixture in our school district. She was uh, passionate about education, passionate about children, passionate about communication. And so we certainly will miss her in Wild Lake Schools. You don't easily replace 19 years of experience. And uh, I think there's a little bit of a shock when people don't get an email from her on a pretty regular basis. But we're grateful for Judy's leadership. And again, we will miss her. Yeah, Judy's uh, been very helpful with us here at the Megacast as well, uh, booking not only yourself but others from the Wild Lake Consolidated School District to continue to keep your parents, your students, your family, and faculty up to date on everything that's going on in Wild Lake as we've continued to navigate through a, a really tough year with a lot of changes along the way. So we definitely appreciate all the help from Judy Evola. We've been joined by Ken Gutman, the superintendent of the Wild Lake Consolidated School District. Ken, uh, just another couple minutes with you before we say goodbye today. Anything else that you'd like to, to speak about today or anything else that would be important for families in the Wald Lake School District to know? Sure, a couple of things. One is I do want to let you know that we have a wonderful new communications director, uh, Vildana Kurtovic, who has a great background in uh, uh, not just in hotels uh, and as their PR person in Manhattan and Atlanta, but also for a private university in Austria. She brings a wealth of experience. She's learning the K-12 environment, but she'll be great and she'll be happy to work with you as well. I also want our families to know we're listening and we care, and we know these are challenging times. We know that every decision we make, for example, masks and that sort of thing, we know that there's a significant number of people who will not like the decisions either way. But we're certainly going to make the best decisions we can on behalf of our children. 
We're excited about this school year. We're ready to get started. We can't wait to have people back. We can't wait to educate. We, we know that this is, we're still not in a normal environment. We hope we're closer to the end than the beginning. Uh, we're just grateful for the opportunity to, to have the trust of our community and looking out for children and making sure we provide them the very best that we can on an individual and a group basis. Ken, if parents or students have any questions as we approach the fall semester, as we get closer to that first day of school, what's the best way they can reach out to your office or reach out to the school district? The best way when there are questions about any of this is to reach out to Vildana Kurtovich. She'll make sure that the uh, emails are, are, reached, are reached by the right people and that uh, depending on whose area of, of expertise it is, we will respond. So Vildana Kurtovich is our Director of Community Relations and uh, should be on our website by now. Well, Ken, we definitely appreciate, as always, having you on the show today, and thank you for being with us. It is always a pleasure. Again, thank you very much, Tyler. Appreciate it. Ken Gutman, Superintendent of the Wald Lake Consolidated School District, joining us here on the Oakland County Megacast. Just about a minute left in today's show. That is going to do it for our program today. I'd like to thank everyone involved in our show. Today, all of our guests on the program on this edition, David Fishman, doc, no, Dr. Um, Dr. Alice Silbergeit joining us from Henry Ford Health System, Jim Nash, U.S. Senator Gary Peters, and of course, Wald Lake Schools Superintendent Ken Gutman. Also, big thank you to our crew today, Ryan Younglove, our, our Zoom producer, and Larry Nylon, our booking producer. Also, a big shout out to Jared and to, uh, also a big shout out to Jared at Master Control, helping with the recordings as well, and Kevin Walsh for joining us on the program to talk about My Michigan TV also. That is going to do it for today's edition of the Megacast. We will return tomorrow morning, bright and early, 10 a.m., as always, on our family of TV, radio, and other outlets. We thank you for joining us today. This has been the Oakland County Megacast.